ready, my brother? Are you ready for the journey? Do you want to see your Jesus? Good morning, everyone. Wow, that was the least enthusiastic good morning I have heard. After all of this and riding the chariots, and we just talked about riding the chariots last Sunday, right? Let's try that again. Good morning. Ah, much better. Now I feel like we are ready to worship the living God uh, who is here, who has prepared this place for worship. We're always grateful to have the Point Loma singers with us. It's a once a year treat uh, we get to have to have them here uh, to guide us and lead us and move us into the presence of the living God. And so we want to welcome you today, whether you're watching online, whether you're with us here in person, we are delighted to be worshiping with you. Uh, God's word reminds us that wherever two or more are gathered, that he is there. And we recognize that God has already been here preparing this place for worship, preparing your hearts for worship. Uh, scripture tells us it is good to take a Sabbath, to take a day to rest, to pray, and to refocus. And part of what worship is about is living into that. So welcome to worship this morning. For those of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Paul Cunningham. I'm one of the pastors here. And on behalf of our elders and our deacons and our staff, we welcome you to worship this morning. Uh, we also want you to get acquainted with the people who are seated around you. So as you are able, I invite you to stand and turn. Welcome one another to church. Please join with me now as we say together the responsive call to worship. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding, so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. 
Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. <clears throat> I belong to your precepts. In your righteousness, preserve my life. Please pray with me now. Lord of all, we thank you for calling us into worship by the power of your spirit this day. By everything we say and do this morning, may we glorify you. Cause our singing to be more than simply words to melodies. Instead, make them meditations on your glory, outbursts of joy. Cause our prayers to be more than empty phrases and memorized formulas. Instead, make them shouts of praise, cries of pain and repentance, tears of gratitude over your compassion and wondrous love. As we hear your word declared today, O oh God, cause our minds to be filled with more than merely distracted thoughts and disconnected insights. Instead, by the power of your spirit and with the eyes of our heart enlightened, renew our minds today with focus, faith, and obedience. Cause us to enter into this morning in the worship of you, O oh Lord, and because of that, empower us to leave different people than when we first walked into this sanctuary today. For we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, I'm Scott Mitchell, one of the pastors on staff here at La Jolla Presbyterian Church. And there are a lot of things going on in the life of this congregation. And there are a lot of ways 
to get connected with those events, with other people, and with Jesus. For instance, uh, the details for everything I'm talking about this morning are online at ljpress.org slash announcements, or you can find them in the today handout that you received when you came in uh, this morning. Honestly, though, um, if I were to uh, say it true, this is actually an abridged version of something more. It's kind of the, the Cliff's Notes, the Reader's Digest version of the weekly newsletter. This is the Super Bowl of announcements that we have around here. <laughs> and we email that out on Fridays, and uh, you can sign up for this. Um, inside this, you'll find uh, clickable links, you'll find the scriptures and other details for Sunday morning worship. Um, and events announcements and a lot of ways that you can get involved with the life of the church and you can sign up for the newsletter by using the connect card i believe those are in your pews today um, this is what they look like that's one side that's the other side make it even easier we have a qr code on that so that should help you also to sign up so that you can get that newsletter um, after the service today if you fill those out you can put them in the uh, donation boxes at the uh, at the exits of the church. We hope you'll do that, or you can just give them to me or Pastor Chad when you see us outside after the service. Uh, yet another way that you can um, get connected, this is more low-tech, and that's just to wear your, well, mine's a little bit sideways here, your name tag. And this is how you meet new people. It's a way in which we actually do build community through these, so they're magnetic, and they are on display outside the door. If you want to see some of them wearing this, uh, helps us all get to know each other better. And if you need one, if you don't have one and you need one, there are order forms at the name tag display, so you can get those there. Um, and I didn't bring this one up, but for a really deep dive uh, into the church, there are today available our annual reports at the tables at the exits today, or you can find them over in the church office. And they've they're, they're got a lot of details in it. They have uh, reports from all of the uh, areas of ministry and a vision for 2023. And it's another way that you can find out about the life and the faith here at La Jolla Presbyterian Church. So lots of ways to connect at LJPC. Finally, hard as it is to believe, Ash Wednesday is coming up on Wednesday, the 22nd of February. And we will mark this Ash Wednesday service with a 7 p.m. service of reflection here in the sanctuary. Uh, ashes will be available for those who would like to receive them, and this is one of the, the most moving services of the year, so we hope to see you there. Folks, the elders, the leadership, and the staff of this church want to thank you for your generosity in ministry. Giving back to God a portion of his blessings is a way in which our own faith grows and it furthers the work of the kingdom. And I want to remind you that you can give online, or via email, or simply by dropping your donation into the donation boxes at the exits. Uh, as you know, due to the, the tragic quakes, there are opportunities to provide earthquake relief in both um, Turkey, for, to both Turkey and Syria. And so today's in the handout uh, or our church newsletter, there are some links there and information there to get you connected with organizations like Hope International and the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, among others. So um, when you take a look at that, and as the Lord leads, give generously. And we thank you for that.
That was wonderful. Please join with me now as we come before our Lord for a time of prayer. I will be praying this morning from a prayer from the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. So let's pray. Lord of the household of faith, we thank you for the gift of faith worked within us by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for calling us to yourself in worship, for consecrating us to your service for life, for having set us apart in this sacred moment of prayer. Lord, we pray for the church in all of her breadth and variety, gathered out of every nation, family, people, and tongue to be a kingdom of priests serving you. We pray for the church in all of the world, for churches in North America, Europe, the Middle East, for churches in Africa, Asia, Latin America, for churches young and old, small and large, weak and strong. Grant to your church true lowliness and genuine humility where there is pride, unity where there is division. Grant to her truth where there is error and wisdom where there is foolishness, that you might fulfill your purposes for her. O Lord, we pray for those to whom you have entrusted the affairs of your kingdom, for pastors, elders, deacons, lay leaders, volunteers, fellowship groups, and committees. We pray for the missionaries who go out from our own La Jolla Presbyterian Church. Whenever they go, may they have safe passage to and from the destinations you send them. Give to all church leaders and volunteers a spirit of willing service and true humility a sense of spiritual devotion, and a delight in those whom they serve. Grant that all of us may lead your people in the way of Christ. O oh Lord, we pray for all peoples of all nations. We pray that in every land there might be peace and true justice. Especially, we ask that an overflowing of your strength, compassion, and mercy embrace Syria and Turkey in the wake of the tragic earthquakes they endured this week. May we stand resolutely with others around the globe who bring prayers, supplies, and your deep succor to the peoples of these nations. By these and other means, Lord, grant amazing grace to those who are injured, those who are troubled, those who are grieving and overwhelmed, that they may find deep support from the world and from your church in this time. O oh Lord, we pray for our nation and for those who lead it, the president and advisors, the Congress and the courts, the diplomatic corps as they negotiate for peace and justice. We pray for the leaders of all nations that they might know that you have called them to serve their people for your glory and for the good of the people. Oh Lord, we pray for those who have special needs, particularly those here at La Jolla Presbyterian whose names, faces, and friendships we know well, to all who suffer any sickness or weakness, give health and strength to all who are disturbed or troubled, give rest and understanding. To all who are lonely and alienated, give fellowship and love. To all who grieve and sorrow, give comfort and assurance. To all who are aged and frail, give homes of comfort and safety and others to help them and a willingness to accept help. All these requests we present to you, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
It was the best of times. No, yeah, yeah. Let's try that again. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. The way in which Charles Dickens begins the great novel, A Tale of Two Cities. It's probably also an appropriate theme for this sermon series as we've been walking through the lives of Elijah and Elisha, talking about the ups and downs of each one of these prophets. I also love the line from Oliver Twist, where it is said that sometimes for a book that you're reading, the best part of it is the front cover and the back cover. (laughs) That is not true of this book. But it is true of books I suspect that many of us have read. But the story of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, from cover to cover, is this incredible story of the God who created us in, our, in his own image and said that no matter what happens, I will pursue you in love and grace and mercy. And though you stumble and fall, I will continue to come alongside you and bear you up and lift you up. And we see the fulfillment of that in Jesus Christ. This incredible narrative, this incredible story that is poured out in words. And so when we read that the word became flesh, it is such an important thing for us to hold on to that God's very word, that the word that God breathed out became flesh and lived amongst us. When I was in seminary, I remember a preaching professor said to our preaching class, You have to remember that when you preach, you must preach the entire counsel of God. Preach the whole counsel of God, and not C-O-U-N-C-I-L of God, but C-O-U-N-S-E-L of God, right? And he was quoting from the Apostle Paul, who in Acts chapter 20 calls the Ephesian elders together and says to them, "Did did I not teach to you the whole counsel, the whole will of God, which the Apostle Paul is saying, do you understand there's a huge narrative to be told, there are lots of stories to be told, and you need to understand the larger themes of the story of God's goodness and the story of God's grace. That phrase stuck with me so much so that in the first 12 years of ministry when I was pastoring in Texas, I wanted to make sure that I preached the whole counsel of God. Because here's the temptation for all preachers. We have our top 20 or our top 40 or some our top 10, right, of texts that we return to again and again and again. And we have no concept of how often we have preached those texts. So with the seminary professor's voice ringing in my ears, the first 12 years of ministry, what I did was I had a Bible where I highlighted or my assistant highlighted every scripture that I preached or every scripture that I alluded to. And when it got really thick with highlighters, I was like, I can't preach that text anymore, right? Because it had been preached too often. So I still hold on to that, and there are certain texts in the scriptures which are amazing, and I know I come back to again and again and again. And then there are certain texts, like the one we are going to read a part of this morning, where I think, good Lord, what am I going to do with this? And today really is one of those texts of, it's a story I remember from my childhood about Elisha being called a bald man and him sicking some bears on some children. Aren't you excited you came to church this morning, right? Because it's like, and and I remember when I was working this sermon series last fall, I was like, Lord, can I please? Like, there's a lot in Elijah and Elisha to preach on. Can't I just skip this part? And I kept hearing, preach the whole counsel of God. So we're going to be looking at a very kind of interesting text this morning. And and I'm hoping I can weave, as I mentioned last week, I mean, some of these great narratives that are in Scripture, it's, it's hard to kind of fathom them. But what really I think the point is always is like, how do we bring this back to our lives? And particularly in the Old Testament, how do we bring this back to where we find Jesus and where Jesus might find us? So uh, we are wrapping up. We've got one more week after this week in our story of looking at the prophets of Elijah and Elisha. 
Uh, this morning we're in 2 Kings. We're going to be reading verses, or chapter 2, verses 19 through 25. We start with the city of Jericho. Okay, there's going to be stories around two cities, the city of Jericho and the city of Bethel. Uh, you may recall last week that Elijah and Elisha made this journey from Gilgal to Jericho to Bethel, across the Jordan River, and now they're back, in, Elisha's back in Jericho. So this is what we pick up, verse 19. The people of the city of Jericho said to Elisha, Look, our Lord, meaning the prophet, this town is well situated as you can see. Um, so the city of Jericho uh, was fed by a, a large group of springs of water, which allowed them to do their agriculture and all the other things that they needed, located about two miles north of the Dead Sea. Um, it's well situated, but as you can see, the water is bad and the land is unproductive. So the springs, have, something's wrong with the springs. Bring me a new bowl, Elisha said, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt into it, saying, This is what the Lord says. I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained pure to this day, according to the word Elisha had spoken. This is where I wanted to stop. A tale of one city. But there are two cities, and these stories go together. So now we look at the second city. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him, Get out of here, Baldy, they said. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. Thank you, Scott. Scott just said, help him, Lord, right? I, that is like, <laughs> for sure. And he went on to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria. And that ends our reading for this morning. <laughs> Let's just go home. There's some scones and coffee outside. It'll be great. <laughs> I want to start with Jericho. Because it is a tale of two cities and I think it's a tale of two choices. Ultimately is where we're going to land this sermon. Jericho, as was noted, was, uh, well, you may recall, it's where Joshua, with the Israelites first went in to uh, retrieve and take over the promised land. They went into the city of Jericho. What is interesting in, about Jericho is in Joshua chapter 6, Joshua actually issues a curse about the city of Jericho. And says, whoever will rebuild Jericho, and then he goes, it's a whole, I'm not going to tell you the whole curse thing. But the city's already been cursed. So guess what happens under the rule of a guy named Ahab? Remember, the worst king ever to rule Israel. Somebody rebuilds Jericho. And there is a curse, and I'm not going to go into all that. But I'm telling you this to say, they understood what it was to have received some sort of like retribu retribution from God. And so they're saying as Elisha walks along, there is a sense of repentance. There is a sense of remorse. There is a sense of, here comes the man of God. Perhaps he can do something about the water that is tainted. Because you can't do produce. You can't live. Like when the water is tainted, there's no way to have life. And so they're crying out and saying, Elisha, please help us. Now, Elisha does a very weird thing because sometimes prophets do very weird things. He says, bring me a new bowl. They bring him a new bowl. Bring me some salt. They bring him some salt. He puts the salt in the bowl. He goes down to the springs. He takes the salt and he chucks it into the spring. Remember, where did I tell you the Dead Sea is in relation to Jericho? Two miles north. Those people of Jericho had to be looking at Elisha saying, what the heck are you doing? We know what the Dead Sea is. is it, a full, it is full of salt and saline. Nothing lives in it. Would you have been thinking the same thing? I saw two of you nod. <laughs> I think it's craziness. And yet he does that. And the waters are restored. Because we never know exactly how it is that God is going to work. And the way in which God is going to bring miracles. And as we've talked about ref before, remember that the purpose of miracles 
are to not only point to God, which certainly they do, but they are to restore things back to order. Both in a sense of a, of a here and now, but also in the sense of a future tense. Miracles restore. They are supernatural in the sense that they actually restore creation back to its natural order. And so we see the power of water, the water that gives life. And so that when you get to John chapter 4 and Jesus encounters the woman at the well and they start having this whole conversation about who he is and who the Messiah is and all this sort of stuff, Jesus says to give to her, he says, I can give you water such that you will never thirst again. You see, the miracle, even in the miracle of the healing of the waters of Joshua of Jericho, is pointing to something greater. Because we know that one day, as the Apostle Paul describes this in Romans chapter 8, creation will be restored. But until then, we wait. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 20. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. We recognize, we look around, we see that God's creation has been broken. It is not good. And so there is this groaning. Not only so, verse 23, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. Now notice this line here. There is going to be a quiz on this. By the way, I'm giving you a heads up before I read this. So if you were here last Sunday, get ready. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Okay, that line right there, the adoption to sonship. For all of you who were here last week, you remember me talking about this, right? Do you remember what I said about it? We talked from Galatians chapter 4. We said that this is what kind of a term, this adoption to sonship? It's a legal term. Like we read it, we're like, because all the women are like, well, adoption to sonship, great. I'm, you know, that, that, that doesn't work for me. It's a legal term where in which the son was adopted into the family. All debts were canceled. A new name was given. They were received in order to become basically like the firstborn son. And you take that then with what the Apostle Paul says where there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, circumcised or uncircumcised. And the Apostle Paul is putting us all on the same level. And so this adoption to sonship, what the Apostle Paul is writing about, when you read that language, he is saying, do you understand what happens to your life? That when you decide to walk with Jesus, you are adopted into the family. You are given the rights of the firstborn son. You have a new identity. You have a, all your debts are canceled. And you have this great and incredible life. Right? I didn't even get an amen for that. I thought that was pretty good, but whatever. All right. Do not miss this. All creation groans. And yet the redemptive work of God continues to happen. The miracles of God point to restoration and point to that one day when all will be restored, when all will be made right. Can we go home now? Because that's the first city. But there's a tale of two cities. And the other city is the city of Bethel. Now it's significant, it's interesting because significant things happen in the city of Bethel. It's where Abraham went after he had the vision of God and God, or God had spoken to him and said, I'm going to make you a great nation. And he goes to Bethel and he builds an altar there. He camps there and builds an altar to the living God. When Jacob had the dream of the angels ascending and descending down the stairs and, and down the stairwell and the ladder, whatever we want to call that, he was at Bethel. But Bethel was not a good place because over the years... They had turned their eyes from the living God. And it actually happened when the kingdom of Israel, you recall this, it's split into two kingdoms, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Right after the reign of Solomon, you have the unified monarchy with David and then with Solomon, and then the kingdom splits. 
10 tribes to the northern kingdom, two tribes to the southern kingdom. Jeroboam's the first king. This is what we read. I want to give you a little context because I'm going to try and weave myself out of this weird scripture that we have in front of us this morning. 1 Kings chapter 12, make sure I start at the right verse, verse 26. Now Jeroboam, so he's the new king, the king of the northern kingdom, okay, of Israel, the ten tribes, thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these people, meaning back, go back to the southern kingdom, because Jerusalem is in the southern kingdom, so this is important. Um, if these people will revert back to the house of David, if these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord Rehoboam, the king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. Now, when someone starts thinking like this, you're like, hmm, there's going to be trouble. And there is. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Did you all just notice what happened there? Here's your calves. Remember the first commandment? No other gods before me. All right, you see where this is going? Hopefully, maybe. Verse 29, one he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. Do you see what just happened here? Bethel had this sort of sacred mystique about it. And then Rehoboam and Jeroboam become kings. And Jeroboam says, come here and worship. It's so much easier. And worship this calf. This is who brought you out of the land of Egypt. We also know that in the city of Bethel, there was a school of false prophets. So it was not like the best of places, all right? Now, I have to admit, I'm trying to build a case here to try and explain away the scripture, okay? Like, this is, this is part of where I'm going with this, all right? Because it was not a great place. And then when Elisha rolls, rolls through, these boys, okay, this is where it is helpful to know the language. Because sometimes when we translate stuff into English, we, you know, the King James, I think, actually says young boys, which is even worse. But if you go and you look at this word, it's a Hebrew word, na'ar. It is used in different places to not simply mean boy, but to mean servant. To be a young servant. And so conjecture is this, that more than likely these, what we have often thought of as young boys, are actually boys who are in the school of the false prophets. And when Elisha rolls into town, they say, hey, Baldy, what's up? Why don't you get on up out of here? And probably they're mocking him because, remember, Elijah has just been taken up in the whirlwind. And the stories have probably spread. They're saying, get out of town. And Elisha calls down this curse. So how do we kind of dig through that? And, and, I, and I'll, I'll warn you that in a few minutes we're going to be talking about God's wrath. Okay, it's so like if this hasn't been bad enough for you yet, we're moving to God's wrath next, all right? And don't get up and leave just because I announced where I'm going with this sermon. So scholars have tried to figure out, well, what is, like, it's, so, it's such a weird, random thing. Like this curse that comes because of the lack of faith and the faithlessness of this group of people in Bethel. We as a people like to talk about the love of God. I as a pastor like to talk about the love of God. But something very strange happens in this text. And so there have been scholars who have suggested that this cursing is actually talked about earlier in Leviticus. And y'all I know have spent a lot of time reading through the book of Leviticus all the codes, all the rules, all the laws. But it's interesting in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 21 and 22, there is an if-then statement. 
And as you recall, as God often speaks to the people of Israel, he says, if you will do this, if you are faithful, then you will be blessed. If you are not faithful, guess what? There'll be judgment. Now, we don't like to talk about that, and we don't like to think about that, but that's the way we read through the Old Testament. So Leviticus chapter 26, verses 21 and 22, listen to this. God says, if you remain hostile toward me and refuse to listen to me, then I will multiply your afflictions seven times over as your sins deserve. And now this line, I will send wild animals against you, and they will rob you of your children, destroy your cattle, and make you so few in number that your roads will be deserted. Ah, man. Do you feel any better about that now? Like, it's just like, ah. But what this curse is doing is it's interesting because it's going against the very nature of what God said in the very beginning to Adam and Eve, which was to be fruitful and multiply. And this curse is like, no, if you're not faithful, there are consequences. And and for those of us living post-Jesus, this is really hard to wrestle with. The sense that, 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 that we would have a God that might be wrathful. A God that might grow angry. And it's hard for me as a preacher to get to that. But it is a fairly biblical concept. Some of you may be familiar with the writings of a man by the name of Miroslav Volf. Wolf is a theologian from Croatia who I find very intriguing to read because he talks about, I'm going to read a quote from him in just a moment, about how he struggled with the concept of the wrath of God until he watched his own nation of what was then Yugoslavia being torn apart. 200,000 people murdered, 3 million people displaced. And he said, where is God in the midst of this? And here's what he writes. I used to think that wrath was unworthy of God. Isn't God love? Shouldn't divine love be beyond wrath? God is love. And God loves every person and every creature. And then this line. That's exactly why God is wrathful against some of them. Then he writes on, Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God is not wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. You see, if we say that God is perfect love, that God is pure love, then there can be no evil in the midst of that love. And God has to do something about that. And God's wrath is displayed. And it's hard to figure that out. It's hard to make sense of of all of that. But when you look at the atrocity of the world, you look at what's happening in Ukraine, you look at wars where innocent people are being completely destroyed. We have to do more than just shrug. And if we say that we believe in a God of love, we have to believe at some way, at some point, in some way, God is going to do something about that. That's not my job, by the way. That is up to God. A year or so ago, after Russia had invaded the Ukraine, we talked about, or I talked about, the idea of the imprecatory psalms 
which seem to call down God's judgment on those who have gone astray, on the enemies of God. And so there is this sense that if we are to say that God is truly a God of all love, there does have to be some sense of judgment. It's not our job to bring the wrath, but we must trust in the living God. But here's the thing. We look at the world and we say, God, bring your judgment. But what about us? What about you and me? The Apostle Paul makes it pretty clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That we are doomed to God's destruction apart from what? Jesus. Because that wrath, that judgment, apart from Jesus, God looks at us and is like, you don't love perfectly. You've fallen, you've strayed. And so what does God do? God sends his son to this world. And I want you to fast forward to the Garden of Gethsemane. What happens in the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus says, Father, please let this cup pass from me. That cup It's the cup of God's wrath. The Hebrew prophets describe, because in those days execution often occurred by drinking a cup of poison. And so the Hebrew scripture, the Hebrew authors of scripture would say, would describe God's wrath as being a cup. And so when Jesus says, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but thy will be done powerful stuff because what he's saying is Lord if it is your will I will take all of that wrath I will take it upon myself so that you and I might live what this means is the forgiveness of sins is never cheap. To receive God's love cost Jesus everything. And ultimately it led him to the cross. And I, I know you all are like, hey, Lent is still a few weeks away. Thank you for taking us to the cross already. It got really quiet in here, by the way. I don't, it's kind of eerie what's happening here. And that's good because we got to preach the whole counsel of God, wrestle with the whole counsel of God. But Jesus takes that. And eventually he ends up on the cross. And we read that story in Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. As Jesus is hanging there, there's a criminal on either side of him, and we read this. One of the criminals who hung there with Jesus hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, even to the very end, Jesus himself was being mocked. Remember the crowd right before this text I read? The crowd said, come on down, Jesus. 
you're the son of God, you can get down from there. And he chose to remain. The criminal next to him mocks him. Says, come on, Lord. Get us off of here. You see, there's always two choices. The other criminal says to Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Do not forget me or forsake me. And at the very end, that cry of faith, Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, there's two cities. Jericho and Bethel. There's two choices. Choosing for God or not choosing God. And for us today, there are two choices. We choose for God and we live. We get restoration. We get remembered by none other than Jesus. Or we turn our back on God. And it's not about guilt. It's not about any of that. It's just simply saying, Scripture says, you have to make a choice. Joshua, we looked at this a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago. Choose today whom you will serve. And Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But as I said a couple of weeks ago, and as I want to remind us today, that choice for serving God is a daily choice. Every day waking up and saying, Lord, I would live for you today. Help me to be faithful. In a world that is sometimes filled with the best of times, in a world that sometimes is filled with the worst of times, Lord, let me live faithfully. Pray with me, please. Lord, we don't know what it's going to look like when you bring your judgment. When those who have wrought atrocities must deal with that. And Lord, it's really not our place to sort that out. But what is our place, Lord, is to decide. Decide whether you are the living, true God who offers us life and hope or to turn away. So Lord, help us in the midst of these strange stories that we read to remember the narrative of your love that pursues us, your son that took on your judgment and your wrath so that we might have life. Because, God, that's the greatest thing we could ask for. Abundant, everlasting life. Lord, help us to live wisely. Help us to live humbly. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
It was a tale of two cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And the best and great and wonderful news that we have is that God has come for us in the person of Jesus Christ, showing us God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, calling us to follow him. What a gift. Um, after I give the benediction, the Point Loma Singers are going to come up and have a post lead for you all. So if you'd like to enjoy that, we'll just encourage you to be seated. Also, after the service, if you need prayer, or know of others who need prayer, Pastor Scott and the prayer team will be available uh, in the back. Also, encourage you to come up on the courtyard, grab a cup of coffee, a scone, uh, hang out, and be reminded of the goodness of fellowship together. Now, receive our Lord's blessing as you go from this place. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father Fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.